G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another trade related video. This time continuing the little series I have going through each of the last few trade periods and doing an assessment of the trades that went down or at least the high profile ones and seeing how they look now. We've got a little bit more data, a little bit more information on the kids that were picked up with the picks that were taken and you can see some of the players that were traded are not even at the club that they were traded to in this particular trade period. So I'm going to go through 2018 today because I've been doing 2019, I've done 20 2020. And if you keep responding to these videos, I will probably keep going further and further back as well. You guys seem to be enjoying the trade period video, guys, so I appreciate that. Appreciate all the support and all the new subscribers that have jumped on very recently. According to the analytics, it still says that only 50% of you who watch my videos have actually hit subscribe on the channel. So if you are enjoying it, please consider subscribing, try to grow this channel as much as possible, and I really appreciate all the support. But anyway, let's crack into uh, some of the bigger trades. I'll start with probably the biggest trade from this particular trade period. I'm talking about Lockie Neal, who left the Fremantle Footy Club along with pick 30 and joined the Brisbane Lions for pick 6, pick 19, and pick 55 in the 2018 draft. Brisbane ended up drafting Tom Berry with the other pick that they acquired, whereas 6 and 19 went to Frio, which they didn't end up actually taking, but it did help them move around those assets to get guys like Jesse Hogan and Rory Lobb into the club. We'll park the Hogan and Lobb talk as well, because we'll get to that later in this video, but I think we can say that Brisbane did fantastically well from this particular trade period that have absolutely no regrets. Lockie Neal has been a Brownlow medalist for them, an absolutely elite midfielder, and his joining of the club sort of common sided with Brisbane shooting right into flag contention as well. And not only that, it kind of signaled a bit of a change in dynamic where Brisbane was no longer a club that would bleed players. Suddenly, good players wanted to play for Brisbane, and that would continue for the next couple of years as well. So to continue this particular assessment, we'll move on to the Jesse Hogan trade. So Fremantle sent pick six that they acquired from the Neil trade, along with pick 23 to the Demons for Jesse Hogan and pick 65. Melbourne didn't end up taking that pick, but they did on trade it to Gold Coast and picked up Stephen May and Colin. Jasney, whereas pick 23 got them Tom Sparrow. With pick 65 or whatever it became, Fremantle drafted Brett Buley as well. From Melbourne side of things, the way they navigated through this, getting pick 6 and on trading it for Stephen May was an absolute masterstroke. We will talk about him shortly as well, but they definitely got an upgrade there and Hogan just managed 19 games for the Fremantle Footy Club and kicked 18 goals, so less than a goal a game, and then got flipped to GWS for very very little. So, at the time there was a lot of optimism about uh, them replacing Neil with at least a key four target, the player that had been linked to for a long time, was highly sought after by both WA clubs. Fremantle won his signature and he ended up being a bust. So that absolutely sucks for them. We'll talk about Rory Lobb now. He was traded along with picks 14, 43, and 47 from GWS to Fremantle, and Fremantle gave up picks 11 and 19. So again, it gets a little bit messy here because Fremantle did some pick swaps, but with the 14 that they acquired in this trade, they drafted Sam Sturt and moved up other picks to 31 to get Valenti. Too early to call on those guys. Sturt, I think, has shown promise at AFL level, but obviously he's had a lot of injuries. Still might be a decent player, but too early to call. And I don't think Valenti's even debuted for them. I did rate him as a junior, but I don't know if he's really going to come on as expected. In the absence of Rory Lobb, the Giants were able to draft Jackson Haitley and Xavier O'Halloran. Haitley is no longer at the club. He walked into the preseason season draft, so they got nothing for him, so that was a bust pick, and O'Halloran seems like a good talent, but again, hasn't really made his mark at AFL level, so it's almost a stalemate. you got to give the points to Fremantle, I'd suggest, though. They got some value out of Rory Lobb, as opposed to the Giants, who O'Halloran may end up becoming a pretty good player, but it's too early to call just yet. The downside for Fremantle here is that Rory Lobb might not even end this trade period at the Fremantle Footy Club, so there's a great irony here where Lockie Neal leaves the club, they replace him with Hogan and Lobb, and there's a chance at the end of this trade period, I'll be the slim one, Lockie Neal could end up for Fremantle, and Hogan and Lobb won't be at Fremantle. <laughs> for the record, don't think Neal makes it to Fremantle in this particular trade period, but I wouldn't rule it out in future seasons. We did touch on the Stephen May trade. He, along with Cade Collard-Jasney, was traded from the Gold Coast Suns for pick six. Now, pick six actually ended up being Ben King, so I think this trade's actually looking quite even. I think Melbourne, absolutely no way they lose this trade because they're a team that was you know, trying to get into contention, trying to plug a hole in their list, and they picked up an All-Australian key defender in Stephen May and Colin Jasny was okay as a sort of role player for a little while there. I think Ben King has a huge future and the Gold Coast have done exceptionally well here. Of course, it remains to be seen whether he ends his career at the Gold Coast Suns or even if he spends more than one more year at that club, but we can't really bring that into this assessment as yet. When you have a player like Stephen May leave the club to bring in a Ben King, that could end up even 
a win for Gold Coast. So it's a little bit too early to tell, but I think both sides are very happy right now. Next, we'll talk about Dylan Shield, who left the GWS Giants in this trade period, along with a 2019 second rounder for picks nine and the first round pick of Essendon in 2019. With the picks they acquired in this trade, GWS drafted Jai Caldwell, and the other first actually helped them match a bid for Tom Green. Caldwell obviously did pan out so well, he couldn't fully fit into that side, wanted to play in Melbourne, and is ironically now an Essendon player. Tom Green, on the other hand, it looks like an exceptional player, one of the best young midfielders from his particular draft class. It's a little bit messy, including them in this analysis as well, because Essendon couldn't really have drafted Tom Green with that pick, but GWS actually got something out of it at least. In terms of the 2019 second round pick that Essendon acquired, uh, they kind of traded away as far as I can tell, but then traded back into that round to get Harrison Jones, who is another very solid talent at the Essendon Footy Club. Overall, Dylan Shue, I think, has been decent. Uh, I think his year this year was kind of affected by injury. He's been a solid player, and for his age profile, the demographic, Essendon's probably a lot happier with having him in the side. They did add to him with Jai Caldwell as well. So you'd have to say this trade in isolation is still a win for the Bombers. I think GWS still would have found a way to match a bid for Tom Greed in the following year as well. So GWS didn't get a whole lot out of this trade. And Essendon still could stand to get a fair few good years out of Dylan Shield while they're moving up the ladder. Next, we'll talk about Dane Beams, who moved with picks 41 and 44 from the Brisbane Lions for picks 18 56 and a 2019 first rounder as well. So two late first round picks. With the picks that the Lions acquired, they drafted Eli Smith. And then after a trade down, they also got Devin Robertson and Noah Answorth. The 41 and 44 that Collingwood acquired probably would have helped them, I'd imagine, with a bid for Isaac Quaynor because he was an academy player for them. As you all know, I'm sure Dane Beams only managed nine games for the Collingwood Footy Club. They were pretty good games to be fair, but obviously life gets in the way sometimes. And obviously for a team that was topping up and in contention, didn't quite hit the mark for the, what they were after. And I think they'd look back at these players that Brisbane acquired in Devin Robertson in particular, plus Answorth and Eli Smith and think, I probably would prefer the three young kids, especially when you consider Collingwood is now in a transition period. So Brisbane have done exceptionally well for a trade for Dane Beams there. Next, we got Dan Hannabury, who moved from Sydney to St. Kilda in this trade period. He left along with pick 28 to St. Kilda, and Sydney got picks 39 and a future second rounder. In terms of those picks, it doesn't appear that Sydney actually used that pick 39, and their future second rounder was kind of involved in a downgrade with the Crows, but they did draft Will Gold with that selection as well. So they at least got one good young player out of it, as far as I can tell. Depends what your opinion is on Will Gould. Hasn't made his mark at AFL level, but they got a prospect out of it. Whereas Hanbury has only managed 15 games in three years for the Saints. And while it makes sense for them, it's still a bit of a loss in terms of what they gave up, I guess. That being said, he's still on the list and could still add some value, but Sydney will be happy, I guess, that they don't have an aging player that they're paying a heap of salary to that's injury prone. They'd rather have Will Gould, even if he probably doesn't play a game. I'm sure they don't necessarily want to reverse this trade. This trade period also included the moves from Port Adelaide of Jared Pollock and Jasper McMillan Pittard or Jasper Pittard as he goes by now. North traded pick 11 for those two players and a future fourth in return for Pollock, Pittard and 48. Again, another one where this gets messy because these clubs sort of traded up and down. Port Adelaide traded 11 up to six with Fremantle, if I'm not mistaken, and then switched five and six with Brisbane for Sam Mays. So they ended up with Connor Rosie out of this. Pittard did start his career at North Melbourne relatively well. He looked like he was going to be a best 22 player for a long period of time, but he's now been delisted and Jared Polek, while he shows flashes of brilliance, is on the outer of that club as well. So given the way that North have embraced the rebuild now, they cooked this. Port Adelaide here are massive winners. I don't know if they miss Pollock or Pittard too much. I'd imagine not, especially when it helped land the talent that is Connor Rosie. There's a certain irony to this trade where Port Adelaide were giving up some established players for picks and North Melbourne were kind of topping up by trying to improve their best 22 in the short term. And now North Melbourne is hardcore in a rebuild with pick one in this year's draft and Port Adelaide were contending making two prelims in a row. Gary Rowan also moved in this trade period from Sydney to the Geelong Cats for pick six. 62. Bit of a token trade for an older, experienced player, but I'd say that Gary Rowan has more than paid back the value that Geelong gave up for him. Obviously, there's a bit of criticism about, you know, his form and his best versus his worst, but overall, I think Geelong are much happier that they've got Gary Rowan than not have him. And equally, I think Sydney probably don't miss him too much considering where their list is at. They've got a lot of young talent. I think Geelong are probably winners out of this trade, but again, Sydney's not losing too much sleep. Now we'll talk about one of the more convoluted trades in this trade period. It was Mitch McGovern, who was involved in a three-way trade to get from the Adelaide Crows to Sydney. In that three-way deal, the Crows received pick 13 and a future fifth round selection, as well as Shane McAdam, who the Blues were able to claim as one of their mature age pre-draft access picks. Carlton gained McGovern and a 
future third round selection and Sydney got involved in this deal because I think they had a father son in Nick Blakey as well. They gave up pick 13 but got 26 and 28 as well as number 40 from Adelaide as well. So the second rounders came in handy for Sydney and they were able to use 40 on McInerney. So they definitely extracted the value out of this particular trade. With the first rounder that Adelaide got, they drafted Ned McHenry and of course got Shane McAdam and they're two good young players. I know McHenry probably hasn't fully made his mark and that's a phrase I'm using a lot in this video, I know, but too early to really call on him. And I think we've discovered that Mitch McGovern, while he can be a decent player, is not worth the big money that he's on. And Adelaide have plummeted into a rebuild since then. So I can see why Carlton went into this trade not wanting to, you know, to take another 18-year-old kid, even if it wasn't the first round. They wanted some established talent. They thought Mitch McGovern was the man. And it's fair to suggest he hasn't really paid off the faith that they showed in him. I think Adelaide, on the whole, will be a little bit happy with this. Uh, I don't see Carlton really regretting it just yet. But overall, I'd probably rather McHenry and McAdam on my list than McGovern. Wow, a lot of mix in this trade. There's a McInerney too. Another talented established player left Port Adelaide in this trade period. Chad Wingard, along with a 2019 third rounder, made their way to Hawthorne for Ryan Burton, picks 15, 35, and a fourth rounder in 2019. With those picks, in addition to getting Ryan Burton, Port Adelaide drafted Xavier Dersma and flipped those later picks for upgrades. And in terms of the pick Hawthorne acquired, they were able to use that in a part of a deal for Sam Frost. This more or less becomes Wingard versus Dersma and Burton. And I think given where they're at, the Hawks probably regret this deal. They're kind of looking at their list now and thinking we're probably not quite in finals contention like we'd intended to be when we recruited that O'Meara, Mitchell, Wingard sort of trio. Wingard hasn't been terrible, but he also hasn't been consistently good for them. And I think Hawthorne would look at this and think, gee, I'd love Dersma and Burton back on the list, given where our list is at. And I personally would rather Dersma on his own versus Chad Wingard. So in hindsight, Port Adelaide have done exceptionally well in this trade period, flipping established players who people thought they might have missed, but they turned them into some really, really good young prospects. So Port will be very happy with that. Another low key trade that was done in this trade period but I thought was worth highlighting was Aaron Hall who moved from Gold Coast to North Melbourne for just pick 68. And considering the form that Aaron Hall's had, he's just had his career best year. It's a great deal for the Roos. Even though they're not contending and he is an established player, I think they'd still rather have him on their list. Another trade I'll talk about wasn't actually a player trade, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it was a trade that was talked about a lot of the time. It was a live trade between Carlton and Adelaide where Carlton acquired pick 19 live in the draft with whom they took Liam Stocker and a future first rounder for Carlton's future first. So Carlton acquired pick 19 and they swapped their first rounders around the following season. So in addition to nabbing Liam Stocker in the draft, the following year, Carlton had Adelaide's pick 11. They then flipped that for 17 and 22 and then flipped 22 for 20. But long story short, they acquired two picks in that top 20 or so and overall ended up with Liam Stocker, Brody Kemp and Sam Phillips. The Crows pick was, I think, around about pick four the following year that they held from Carlton, but they ended up downgrading that to get Fisher Mackesy. So overall, I think you can compare the trio of Stocker, Kemp, and Philp versus Fisher Mackesy. I think on the whole, Fisher Mackesy is probably the best talent out of those kids, I think, and I think Adelaide will be very happy with that. But you've got to sort of praise Carlton as well for turning in three top 20 picks in Liam Stocker, Brody Kemp, and Sam Philp. So a little bit of a win-win, and again, only time will tell who is the best player out of those kids. But I think Carlton have also done a very good job of giving them the best chance of unearthing a genuine gun. Time will tell on that one, but because it was talked about so much at the time, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at where it sits now. Anyway, guys, that is that for the 2018 trade period wrap. Let me know in the comments what you thought of my assessments, whether you agree or disagree let me know in the comments as well if you think I should continue this series by doing the 2017 trade period next as well because I think it's good fun to go back and see who did well in hindsight there's a lot of talk after a trade period of how well the team's done but you don't really know for a good few years yet and we're starting to get into the territory where we know which teams genuinely did well but anyway guys appreciate if you could like the video if you enjoyed it subscribe if you're new and I'll see you in the next trade related video cheers guys